Jamboard. Has anyone used Jamboard before in this group? Okay. It's pretty fun. It's a nice kind of interactive way when we're, you know, all in our little Zoom boxes to hopefully um, connect a little bit and keep track of our notes and things like that. So Alex is having some connection issues. That's okay. Um, so I think, uh, first of all, who, is there anyone here that would like to be a presenter for when we take our stuff back? For anyone who'd like to scribe? Or do you wanna just decide at the end? I'm happy to do either. Um, I can start with scribing, and then okay. if presenting seated as well, I can do that. Okay. Yeah, and if you want to just open the Jamboard and let me know if you're having any issues. Um, okay, I'm on the board. So yeah, you could just friends here too. Yeah, you could just try um, clicking on the health needs post it, and if you can edit that, then great. Yep. I'm able to. I see it. Okay, perfect. Great. So you all should be able to see if you're on the GM board, you can see in re real time kind of what notes we're taking and what should be added or things like that. So Dr. Tobin, I don't know if you want to um, kind of walk us through what, what we want the group to go over. So um, my understanding was in the auto assignments, we didn't have the benefit of a community member. Is that true? Or do we have a community member, community representative among us? So then let me ask the question a little differently. Which of you currently is working with a community partner just by raising your hand? Okay, not seeing. In the general sense, <laughs> like for Aaron, who's projects. The, who's the partner and what's the topic? Um. So I'm a little nervous because I'm not positive, like the full definitions, um, but I'm just going to say whatever. So I'm involved in um, actually a sickle cell project. Um, so Vicki, I'm excited to collaborate with you. Um, and so involved in a sickle cell project and then also a lead poisoning project right now both. And I'm kind of in like the research and advocacy space on the lead. Um, which is really interesting. And Delaware has a lot of um, policies that are like working to get re-regulated. So I'm kind of like doing research on the medical or within the Medicaid claims, but then also involved in these conversations, which feels very translational, um, but there are definitely some missing gaps. Um, so that's an example. Okay, so we have two identified health needs, uh, sickle cell and lead poisoning. Anybody uh, want to offer a preference for which of the two we try to work through, or is there something underlying that unifies the two of them? Also open to other ideas. Yeah, can you expand, Aaron, on what you're doing with the sickle cell? Oh, yes. Yeah. So um, I am partnered. I just finished up a descriptive profile with Nemours, um, and it was very descriptive, um, but we are looking to expand and look at more um, medication adherence. And um, I feel like you probably actually know a lot more on this realm than me, but um, one of the uh, ideas that we're looking at is looking at um, health utilization before and after entering the specific pediatric special care program. Um, Truthfully, I probably am not best at leading a conversation in that just because I'm still learning on my own. So I'd be more comfortable on the lead one. Um, yeah, sure. But what, what organization are you with? I'm, I'm sorry. Um, so I work for the University of Delaware. Oh, okay. Um, Medicaid you. Research Program. Thank yes. you. Um, so the the sickle cell was an injury. Um, yeah, I know, I know a lot about that, but I agree with you. If you're you know more comfortable with lead, and then we can involve more of the uh, of our team in that 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 might be that might be better. That's great, and I look forward to collaborating in the future. Yeah, certainly. So certainly. 
other suggestions? Shall we use that as our as our test case here? Okay, so Vicki, can I ask you, since you've had some experience with this, where is your work related to lead poisoning currently taking place in the spectrum? And uh, if you can put a, um, a post-it note and just a brief statement in the location in terms of priorities, what's the priority of your so Aaron, work? Aaron, that's you, right? Aaron. If we're okay with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I, I don't do work on the lead, but I do work on the sickle cell. Um, yeah, so sorry, it, that might have been confusing, but yeah, <laughs> we're kind of all over. <laughs> we're all over. <laughs> okay, so I can kind of kick us off. Um, this is my first time seeing one of these boards, but I'm excited to to try. So, where is the work? Um, so I think the first framing, um, lead. Elevated blood lead levels in kids is like a very big topic and the a threshold for um, getting like special services, like your lead level has to be at a certain point for you to receive special services. And that level used to be 10 micrograms per deciliter and it was lowered to five. And now the CDC has it at 3.5 but not everyone is like caught up on that conversation across the state. So I would say that is like a starting point because we're working to translate why it's important to be recognizing that lowest level as the most important. Okay, so let me get some feedback from some other participants. Perfect. From Do you hear that that question is a T4 question that it has to do with the impact on community or is it and policy really community and policy go together in that box or is this more of a basic science question that says at what level of exposure does the do the detrimental effects of lead begin to kick in I, I thought the detrimental effects that work had already been done I, I, I don't know in what kind of models, but that's what I heard from Aaron. I could have heard wrong, but so I would yeah. think it would end in the, um, be more in the um, T4. Yeah, it feels like this might not provide, it feels like we are in the T4 range, but curious to hear what others think. So let's stick with that for a moment. And then let me ask one of the other uh, members here. So this is in the realm of the regulatory. So who are the partners? that would be really critical to have at the table if we wanted to change the regulatory requirements. Nicole, please. I mean, would we have to involve like the housing department? Because I'm actually, I'm actually confused because I mean, I, I am, I guess I have children in each decade for the past three decades. So I remember seeing these questions early on. My oldest is 25. Oh, have you lived in a residence where it was painted prior to such and such a date? But I find it weird that now I have a seven-year-old and that question is still on like medical forms, asking that question, thinking that over the course of these 20 years, that paint would have changed over, over the course of time. So I guess housing department. Okay, so Department of Housing, who are some of the other regulators that we would care, that would care about this? educational departments the school should be painted also okay the school should be painted and uh, certainly um, the cognitive effects of lead poisoning lead toxicity will translate into poor educational outcomes so right. it would strike me that the department of education has at least two separate interests mm -hmm. in other thoughts who else should we be talking with I mean, from, from Aaron's comment, it sounds like not everyone's caught up with the guidelines. So clinicians who are seeing kids, right, should make sure that they're looking for these lower levels. So I would put that in the T3 category, right, because that's translation to practice. So we would want clinicians and um, who alongside of clinicians might be important, both advocates and disseminators of this. 
nurses? Because oftentimes nurses are in the schools. So school nurses would be another group. Mm -hmm. Right. Who else? Public health. So where would public health go? Is that more T3, T4? T4, I believe. <laughs> so when you say public health, uh, the Department of Health, would that be another entity that we'd want to bring yeah. in? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Good. So we have Department of Health, Department of Education, Department of Housing. <laughs> All right, so now let's, let's try to walk backwards a little bit into uh, more of the early stage translation, basic science, uh, first translation into humans. So who are the people that should be part of this if we were, again, as Dr. Koss mentioned earlier, sometimes it's policy changes that generate a whole new set of basic science questions. So if we think of policy as natural experiments, if we go down to a cutoff of 3.5, uh, in a sense, we've, we've now done a natural experiment, those who were exposed to a higher level, those who were exposed to a lower level. So who are the, who are the investigators and other partners that might be important here? Susan, were you going to say something? You came on mic and then off mic. You're muted, Susan. I'm sorry, I just joined the group. Um, I, I'm a bit late. I was um, off doing something with patients, so I apologize for my lateness. Oh, that's okay. Other Susan, were you going to add something? Yeah, it wasn't I, because uh, I'm normally on the translational side, and so this early like bench science with clinical trials, like I don't have experience with it. So I'm not exactly sure who would be these, you know, key stakeholders and partners. So that, but that's really the, the purpose of this exercise to just speculate on who's really missing here. So are there, so staying in the T3, T4, are there advocacy groups or community groups that haven't been mentioned that should be part of this? Would the EPA be involved? So back to the regulatory agency, mm -hmm. so the EPA at a federal level, and who's their counterpart at a state level or at the local level? Anybody know? So in New York City, there's a Department of Environmental Protection. That's, an, that's the uh, community level version that works with the EPA, which has an office in New York. Uh, so Delaware is Region 3 of the Public Health Service. So there would be a Region 3 office of the EPA and probably in the state capital, a DEP, and perhaps in the local community levels at the county level, a DEP. Learn something new. <laughs> it's great. What about, what about the Department of Agriculture or some type of nutritional factors? So say a little bit more about how they would fit in. Um, maybe if they find that there's some type of lead in the soil from chemical plants or something like that. I'm not sure how that would work, but possibly. It's, it's an interesting concept. So Dana, in a um, uh, neighboring state to Minnesota or near closer to Minnesota than we are. Michigan certainly has had some experience in Flint recently with um, understanding contamination of the water supply. So who's responsible for the watershed? Delaware has one of the largest um, beachfronts in the United States. That's one of the famous facts I remember from Trivial Pursuits. So uh, there's certainly a, optimal, a lot of opportunities for uh, water to be contaminated by lead when you have that much waterfront. So who, who would be the likely partners that would help us with water management? 
Is that Denrec? Um, That's what I was thinking. Yeah. Help me with that acronym. What is that? D N R E C. And who is that? Who are who? Are? The Department of Natural Resources and like environmental something another. Yeah, I can't remember exactly what it stands for. So control. So that may be the equivalent of the city, New York City Department of Environmental Protection. That mm -hmm. uh, I would say that mirrors. So we have a lot of regulators, and so, but who are the people that um, advocate the regu for the regulators? Who are the groups of parents? Who are the groups of teachers? Who are the groups uh, that might be important in terms of advocacy? What about the American uh, Medical Association, the American Nurses Association? And AAP, Academy of Pediatrics. Mm, oh, yeah. So I would put those three in the T3 category, and these would be important for both education and advocacy. Uh, if we wanted to do some continuing education, they are some of the accrediting bodies of continuing medical, continuing nursing education. But we know that education alone may make clinicians smarter, but doesn't necessarily change their practice and may not necessarily change the environmental exposure. So again, let's try to push this exercise a little bit back. Who are the scientists that need to be at the table in order to provide some of the basic information here? We need implementation scientists to maybe work on implementing things into the medical record to make sure they they test for lead and so forth. So you're thinking of the HIT, the people who run the electronic health records as right. yeah. a flag. So that's a, a really good and sustainable. Somebody asked me about sustainability this morning. So embedding protocols uh, or order sets within the electronic health records is one very established way of, of changing practice and sustaining that over time. Erin, who were some of the basic scientists, and Vicki as well, that were involved in this early work of determining the adverse health effects of lead? What kind of disciplines do you think they come from? So I see a lot of connection with the um, early care and education realm because children were identified with developmental delays and then found to have high lead levels. Um, and then, so that's, but that still feels a little translational. Um, so there's literature as to how that like testing first started in finding those high levels um, and treatment of it as well. Um, so, I'm, I'm trying to think about those key players that we'd want to list. Give me just one minute. I want to make sure I'm getting the names right. So think about the, the cascade. You have screening, you have diagnosis, and you have treatment. So there's broad screening that uh, is the public health, there's diagnosis, people presenting with some kind of symptoms, signs or symptoms, and then there's treatment, what kind of uh, interventions chelation, et cetera, have been developed that are applied in this population? And, and uh, what, what are the effects of that treatment on the outcomes that we're interested in? Before we even get to that stage, when there's something that's happening in one state, state legislators tend to hear about that and pass l laws to require certain kinds of testing, which may be at the newborn stage. Um, so, and so that's and that's where some of those laws come down the pike that mandate that everybody get tested. Mm -hmm. So I guess we haven't put the legislators in. So would they also right. go to the T4 column? Yeah, I was going to think the Department of Justice, because maybe there's some link to like criminal activity in kids that aren't caught early. So they have like these behavioral problems that then turn into something else that then turns into them getting into like the justice system somewhere or another. Okay. Um, so again, we're very heavy on T4 here. And I think that's yeah. <laughs> very heavy on governmental agencies and um, 
Some people would say uh, that government is not part of the solution without the external forces of advocacy. So I would just try to go back. So we had a good set of clinician advocates, uh, AMA, ANA, AAP. I haven't heard a recommendation. Who are the advocates that represent either parents or school teachers or educational administrators or housing departments? Who are, who are the advocates for housing, education, et cetera? particularly in Delaware, who are the people that uh, you would think of that might make common cause here? So there are uh, programs for free abatement um, and removal of lead uh, within the state. Um, yeah, would HUD, HUD be involved? Yep. And you think part of the reason why we can't get um, people to participate in research studies is that we don't know who to particularly ask or who to make that bridge between the clinicians and the researchers and the community. So how would we go about identifying uh, to whom lead poisoning and lead expo environmental lead exposure is a significant issue? What are the strategies that Excel has in place that could be deployed here? I mean, they could do more to correlate levels of lead and um, developmental milestones or, or you know, that, that sort of thing. They could do that study to confirm, although I, I'm just assuming that, you know, it already has, those studies have already been done, but I'm not, that's where I'm not clear. Um, but that, that's something, so you need, you know, you need clinical coordinators, you need biostatisticians, you need uh, clinical labs, a chemist, chemist, chemistry involved. Okay, so now we're moving it back in the spectrum, so we yeah, can. Yeah, that's what, yeah. In, right. So uh, you're talking about uh, clinical labs that mm -hmm. do some of the basic testing. And um, somebody had mentioned before whether the testing happens routinely among newborns. So is newborn testing, is that the right time? Uh, is this something that requires early childhood exposure? So who are the advocates and the representatives that would say, if you test at age two, it's too late, or if you if you initiate treatment at age two, it's too late, or if you wait till age six when they begin to enter school, it's too late because by that time the developmental lags have already, the, the cortical changes have already taken place. So who are the neuroscientists that need to be part of this discussion that understand what normal growth and development looks like and then can say something about uh, the toxic exposure of lead. Right. Neurologists, um, child psychologists, I, I mean, I you know, developmental. Uh, um, there's some standards coming out of the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, which is, the, which is promoted by the American Academy of Pediatrics. So again, those are, those are, are I mean, they're not the scientists, but they've done the work to understand the impact. But they no doubt had the uh, the laboratory scientists, okay. neurologists, psychologists, developmental pediatricians, the, the, the groups who are uh, critical to the diagnosis and perhaps to the, treat, the screening diagnosis and treatment. Um, at the risk of pushing us even further, mm -hmm. uh, are there animal models that we should be looking at here. And I would imagine that some of the assessments that got us down to 3.5 were extrapolated from, for example, mouse models. I, I'm familiar with an investigator, formerly of Rockefeller, now at University of Texas, uh, who, when she presented her study of lead poisoning, looked at, uh, to me, it was, it was novel uh, to mouse experiment as it isn't, but nose poking as the cognitive outcome of curiosity. So mice that uh, are put in a, in, a, in a matrix with a lots of 
little holes where the mouse can poke their nose, they would do quantitative assessments of the count and frequency of nose poking as a way of assessing their curiosity. And those mice that were exposed to lead had a diminished count of nose poking. It's not a model I would have thought of, <laughs> no. but uh, apparently a validated model that assesses curiosity in mice. So uh, I'll add to that uh, T0, T1, uh, whether there are animal models, such as a mouse model. Mm -hmm. Again, it's hard to extract from mice to humans. On the other hand, uh, it's plausible to do an experimental exposure study with mice, where it would be unethical to do such a study with humans, although uh, changing, if states have different uh, standards, those natural experiments might substitute for some of those quantitative models. There, there, there's data, data coming out of the CDC that this is, they have a 30 year um, program for lead, lead, childhood lead poisoning. And so it would be interesting to see how data in our area stacks up against their data throughout th over, over time. Yeah. Um. And the blood lead reference value is set from data from the National Health and Nutrition exam cycle, which is the T4 end, um, but then circles back because if that rate isn't monitored, it never would have been lowered to catch more of those kids in that first phase when the testing is occurring. Oh, one more minute. All right, so um, we- Jonathan, think, we're gonna rejoin the group. As we're ready. Soon as we we ready have a ready. good, yeah, good stopping point. Okay, I would just ask whether there are any priorities that we didn't articulate that should be here. What's the, what's the unifying priority here across all of the T's? Group health, Lower our children's health. exposure to lead. Yeah. Lowering exposure and eliminating disparities. We didn't really talk about that uh, lead paint may be more associated with certain communities and certain neighborhoods mm. that create uh, and perpetuate certain disparities. Yeah, that's our biggest push is linking the high lead levels with their geographic location. Um, and Nicole, as you started within this conversation, that's exactly um, the crisis that we work to address that this is still an issue. Um, yeah. because of the older homes and the other unfortunate sources that have been found to have those high levels. Um, are we rejoining? Sorry. Yeah, so let's take a break. We're gonna go back and talk with the other group to see what they've been doing. So you just say leave room, leave breakout room, and then we'll return to the main one. Okay, okay great job, everybody. Thank you.